Welcome to another Bills and Brews Web Extra. Today we have on DC author and historian Garrett Peck, who knows all about DC's sordid history with boots. Today we're going to learn about the congressional bootlegger, the man in the green hat. Welcome to the show, Garrett. Only fitting we're at the Temperance Fountain today. My staff wouldn't allow me to bring a craft beer out here, but we'll make do without it. We'll suffer, Matt, somehow through. And so I understand D.C. has a sordid little history with, uh, with alcohol, especially Prohibition. Can mm-hmm. you tell us about the man in the green hat? Yeah, the man in the green hat was actually named George Cassidy, and he was the chief congressional bootlegger from 1920 until 1930. So he bootlegged for Congress for, for, for 10 years during Prohibition. So even though almost all these congressmen were voting dry, but there were 80% of them were wet in their personal lives, and they still wanted a drink, and he was the man who supplied them. And their districts were dry. Voters mm-hmm. supported being dry, yeah. and yet they voted like their district, but then they drank like their constituents. So yeah, what? yeah. Po- politically, they because of the, the power, the political power of the anti saloon League at the time, which was the organization that gave us prohibition, the 18th Amendment, they essentially were squeezed into voting dry. Uh, even though most of them were still wet in their personal lives. Uh, the man in the green hat, he uh, had a special relationship with Congress. Yeah, he did. He uh, was a World War One veteran, and he didn't have a job after he came back. And then one of his, he moved back here to Washington, and one of his friends said, I, I know a couple of Southern uh, congressmen who want to meet you and to see whether or not you can you know, hook them up with some alcohol. And he said, sure. So these both were men who were dry, who had voted dry, you know, but they still wanted to drink whiskey. So <laughs> he got them hooked up with a couple bottles, and then the customers started coming. And pretty soon they they uh, gave him an office in the in the basement of the Cannon House office building. So insider access, kind of like we see today, but mm-hmm. on a different level. Exactly, yeah. And, and back then for Congress, with the, with the Capitol Hill police, they would only search you when you left the building. And of course, congressmen had the prerogative not to be searched at all. So George Cassidy every day could come in with a suitcase full of liquor bottles, bring it right to his office, resupply his closet, and then dole out the, the hooch to, to all the congressmen. And he had his own key mm-hmm. for this room. Yeah, this, this was his office. Yeah, an actual office they gave him in the basement. Four out of five congressmen and senators drank alcohol. And he would know because they were all his customers. He bootlegged for Congress for 10 years. Um, from 1920 to 1925, he bootlegged on the House side. And in 1925, he got arrested for the first time. And he was out of prison in no time. But he decided at that point he was going to shift over to the Senate side because senators were more discreet. But now he did write a bunch of front page articles for the Post. Mm-hmm. I like to, well, he, what he was doing was illegal. I like to liken myself to the man in the green hat, exactly. the, the legal yeah. version. Yeah. <laughs> he, he got arrested for the second time in February of 1930. And as part of his plea agreement with the judge, he was going to have to go to jail for a long time. But he reached a plea agreement with the judge, whereby he promised never to bootleg again, and he was true to his word. And for that, he got a 90-day jail sentence. Um, he lived on Capitol Hill at the time, really close to the D.C. jail, so about a five-minute walk from his home. So he walked over every morning, signed himself in, and then signed himself, signed himself out at night. So he never actually spent a night in jail, and because uh, <laughs> everybody liked him. He was a he was not a nonviolent felon, right? Yeah. Basically, so they you know they didn't want to put him in jail or whatever. So. Yeah, so, uh, and then the Washington Post approached him about doing this, this series of articles, and he really, he tattled on Congress. You know? hmm. He didn't, like I said, he did not actually ever name any names, but he, he discussed exactly where he bought the booze, how he got into the houses of, of Congress, uh, who his customers were, you know, four to five, and then so on. Just a remarkable story. So it's interesting that the man in the green hat never carried a gun. That's unlike other bootleggers across the U.S. at the time. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable here in D.C. There was so little organized crime and so little violence associated with Prohibition. Uh, we didn't have the big criminal gangs like other like other cities did, and therefore, largely the bootleggers were a bunch of amateurs. And for the most part, there was very little violence. There was some, but not much. And so guys like Cassidy didn't have to carry a gun. And it's fascinating. So can you give us a snapshot of the drinking culture in D.C. at that time? Mm-hmm. What was it? Speakeasies in the Capitol? Did- Did the city change, the culture change at all? Oh yeah, I mean, before Prohibition, Washingtonians overwhelmingly drank beer. And long comes Prohibition, and uh, beer isn't all that profitable if you're a bootlegger, so you start bringing in distilled spirits because it's so much more concentrated, you get a lot more cocktails out of it. So that's what all the bootleggers bring in, you know. And most of the, there were actually about 3,000 speakeasies around the city 
for the most part, though, they were actually in people's apartments, in people's homes. You know, people just operated, uh, you know, in their either their living room or whatever. So yeah, we didn't have all the big swanky clubs. We had a couple of them in D.C., but uh, compared to, like, say, New York City, which had the Cotton Club and these, you know, huge jazz era speakeasies, we didn't have actually many of those. It was much more like private establishments. What was the Capitol Hill drinking culture? Because I understand there used to be a bar in the Capitol itself, mm -hmm. and that was closed, obviously, for prohibition. Yeah, it uh, closed actually in the first decade of the of the uh, of the 20th century by uh, the anti saloon League. Uh, managed to force the, the congressman to close down their own bar, you know, <laughs> through political pressure. But then they just moved the bar to their offices. It basically, yeah, they they drove the drinking underground, basically. You know, I mean, alcohol is so fundamental to American culture. I mean, I, in so many ways, I think the temperance movement was so naive to think that people were not going to drink, you know, despite them all tutting about it. You know, the fact is people still wanted to drink, including most congressmen, and they still were going to, you know. And there's so many House members, I understand some House members were actually arrested, but none of the senators mm -hmm. for uh, breaking prohibition. Yeah, this is indeed true. So I don't think too, too many of the House members stayed in jail very long, you know, but because uh, politically that wouldn't be too wise, you know, a judge to keep someone behind bars very long. So, but the senators were fairly discreet, you know, they are known as the elder statesmen. So is it safe to say the politicians of that era were pretty hypocritical? Oh yeah, yeah, hugely, you know. <laughs> I mean, if you're, all, if you're voting to support prohibition, if you're enacting the budget and so on, and yet you're, and yet you're drinking in your, in your private life, I mean, it's, it's a huge hypocritical gap, you know, and the fact that so many of them, most of them were still drinking during prohibition.